so this is an image of the calcium receptor. You can see we have a couple different subunits. Uh, and down here on the uh, intracellular domain, there's some interesting stuff that's going to happen. The process is known as autophosphorylation. So the insulin receptor is going to... Wow. We're, we're all right. The insulin receptor is going to exhibit autophosphorylation. And so the name suggests that the insulin receptor itself phosphorylates itself. That's the autophosphorylation. And so one of the things that you should expect since we have phosphorylation here is that we're going to have some sort of kinase domain or kinase part of this particular receptor. And so the activation of the insulin receptor results in, so when insulin binds to activate the insulin receptor, we're activating a tyrosine kind of kinase domain. Now what we always need to remember in terms of physiology is whenever you bind something to a protein, such as the insulin molecule binding to the insulin receptor, that receptor, that protein changes its shape. In the process of changing its shape, we activate this thing called the tyrosine kinase domain. So this is your tyrosine kinase domain. And you can see eventually we're going to add phosphates to both sides of that uh, intracellular subunit. So in addition to that autophosphorylation to turn on the insulin receptor when insulin is bound, we have additional proteins that are also phosphorylated. So additional proteins that are going to be phosphorylated. In particular, we have a protein that's called IRS1 is the insulin receptor substrate. Insulin receptor substrate, or IRS1. And what you can actually see is when IRS1 is activated, we're going to Clearly, spend some ATPs here to turn on the intracellular domain, and then once those, uh, once that tyrosine kinase domain is turned on, we can actually phosphorylate and interact with IRS1, and then IRS1 will turn on PI3 kinase, which is the beginning of a PIP2 response. Insulin binds, changes the shape of the receptor, which activates this tyrosine kinase domain that autophosphorylates the insulin receptor. Once the insulin receptor is autophosphorylated, it increases its phosphorylated capabilities, and we start to phosphorylate other proteins. The big one to keep track of is IRS1. IRS1, in its active form, will activate a PIP2 response. The results of activating the insulin receptor and all these other downstream things that have occurred is they have an increase in glucose uptake an increase in the number of glucose transporters to the cell membrane I just put this as increase in the number of glucose molecules that are transported across the cell membrane. Uh, this is facilitated by a protein called glucose transporters or glutes. 
proteins, they translocate up to the cell membrane, insert into the cell membrane to have an extracellular domain, and through facilitated diffusion, will pull glucose into the cell. So really, the PIP2 pathway is going to lead towards these glucose transporters to be translocated up to the membrane. And so that's what I want to pick up with here and talk through what's happening in order to get a glucose transporter up to the membrane. Okay? So here's our insulin receptor, our IRS, leading to the PIP2 pathway. And you can see that we actually are going to activate a protein called AKT. AKT phosphorylates this protein called AS100, and then we initiate this, um, this RAB GTP, RAB GDP uh, mechanism. This mechanism here will cause these vesicles with glute transporters in the vesicle to translocate up to the cell membrane. And through basically exocytosis, that membrane from the vesicle fuses with the cell membrane, opens up, and then you have this cluster of individual glute or monomers. Okay, so the um, the glute four transporters are basically in the cell, waiting in that vesicle. When insulin binds, it's just a mechanism to drive that vesicle up to the cell membrane, so that glute four can be. Uh, can be expressed in the membrane, and now we can interact with the actual cellular glucose. So that process of translocation of the glucose transporters is the end result of activating the insulin receptor and activating the PIP2 pathway. Okay, so translocation of the glucose transporters. As I've already mentioned, we have vesicles that are waiting in the cytoplasm that contain in the membrane of the vesicle our glucose transporters. That particular mechanism from insulin through PIP2 causes the translocation or the movement of that vesicle, that glute transporter containing vesicle, to move up to the cell membrane and to dock with the membrane. Now the other side of the figure there is you can see that we're going to have the individual glute 4 transporters, they'll pick up insulin and they'll be brought back in, and they go through this continuous kind of loop of recycling where they get brought, back, brought into the cell, glucose is released into the cell, then we move those back out, and we kind of do this whole recycling loop here of our GLUT4 transport. Continually recycled. And that recycling process, let me scoot things over just a little bit. So as we bring the GLUT4 transporters back in through endocytosis, we form an endosome. And that endosome basically has two different ways that it can go. We can sort it back over to a, um, into a vesicle and then bring it back out. Or it may actually get recycled um, or exposed to uh, things like peroxides and other protein degrading uh, enzymes and chemicals to basically recycle the amino acids and go through transporters. And that happens through the endosome. Okay, so insulin comes in, PIP2 pathway, docking of 
the vesicles already containing GLUT4, they pick up glucose, get brought back in, and are going to be recycled um, through either sorting or through the endosome, and then continue the whole cycle again as long as insulin is associated with the insulin receptor on that cell. So the regulation effect here. When insulin levels increase, this results in a decrease in the number of receptors. Okay? So when you bind the insulin receptor, you actually will activate that insulin receptor, but also eventually lose that insulin receptor. And so the insulin receptor is classified as being uh, very, very sensitive. Every time we bind the insulin receptor, this increases carbohydrate intake. And when I say intake, I'm talking about with, with high levels of insulin, low levels of receptors, it actually causes the organism to consume more carbohydrates. And so this has been shown when the mechanism goes av uh, aberrant, to lead towards obesity. Right? So once the mechanism kind of breaks down, this can lead towards obesity and result in excessive exogenous insulin. So with insulin, high receptor levels start to decrease over longer periods of time. This can lead towards uh, an increase in glucose uptake, or intake I should say, uh, excessive exogenous insulin remaining inside of the bloodstream and can lead towards obesity. In order to upregulate the receptor number, you have to decrease insulin. So it turns out that the way that we consume food is actually going to be beneficial in this idea of reducing insulin to cause upregulation of the receptor number, which makes you more sensitive to insulin and to glucose uptake. So things like fasting result in an increase in the receptor number because of a decrease of insulin. Another really potent effector of upregulating regulating the insulin receptor is actually exercise. And so not eating continuously, especially uh, sugary meals, is going to allow insulin levels to decrease. Exercise is going to allow insulin levels to decrease as well as you're utilizing glucose, causing more insulin receptors to be available and ready to interact with extracellular glucose. So individuals who lead a sedentary life and may have very eating habits, they eat um, more or less constantly, and especially really sugary, um, sugary foods, sodas, and candy bars, and things like that, will actually begin over time to affect insulin levels, increasing insulin levels on more constant basis resulting in a downregulation of the receptor, becoming increasingly less sensitive to insulin. And eventually you can see where this is going to go. It's going to go towards things like insulin-dependent meta meta metabolic diseases and diabetes and things like that. Now, insulin targets three primary tissues targets the muscle, the skeletal muscle, and adipose tissue or 
fat tissue. When we expose muscle and fat to insulin, I don't know why I keep putting this stupid E on the end of insulin. So when we expose muscle and fat to higher levels of insulin, normally a normal physiological response is to increase glucose uptake by about 20 to 40 times. So glucose transport increases uh, pretty significantly. In the liver, which is the other main target for insulin, so muscle, adipose tissue in liver, when we expose the liver cells, the hepatocytes to insulin, you'll see a various range of increase from 20 to 30 times higher glucose intake. So 20 to 30 times increase in glucose. Now the response time here. How long does it take for glucose intake to begin to occur after you've had uh, ingestion of sugar? Yes. Oh, uh, well, would you like to try answering? Transport. Well, so the transport and the uptake are connected, right? Because the, the transport, glucose binds to the GLUT4 transporter, inducing the GLUT4 to uh, come into the into the cell. Okay? So you could you could put it the same way that I did here. It's kind of synonymous at this point. So uh, response time. You ingest sugar, how long before you have um, how long before you have glucose uh, transport? How long before you have transported glucose out of the extracellular tissue? So it's not quite that fast. So closer to thirty. Huh? You're gonna just say just thirty? Three hours. Yes. We're always in a state of. It's going to be 10 to 12 minutes after the release of insulin, and it takes a couple of minutes for about 15 minutes to 20 minutes for insulin actually to begin to be released after you consume a sugary. So if you were to inject insulin, 10 to 12 minutes after you've injected insulin, you can see regulation of glucose levels. Okay. Um, with the liver and the insulin, is that really when you release the pre-reserve cell? So when insulin levels increase and we have more insulin binding to the insulin receptor of hepatocytes, Glucose transport between no activation of the insulin receptor versus activation of the insulin receptor because of that exposure will be two to 30 times. The difference between those two states, basically a non-insulin exposed state and an insulin exposed state. Same thing for muscle and fat. Does that make sense? And so your response time here, 10 to 12 minutes post-insulin, you begin to see a significant amount of glucose um, glucose up, uptake or glucose transport across the cell membrane. Okay? So, like, uh, what is it? If, like, say, like, a diabetic, if, like, 10 to 12 minutes after they they go, like, not quite drunk, but, like, lost their drink, is that, like, replaced? How do you ingest the sugar? It depends on the type of diabetic. So, uh, and we're going to talk about the different types of diabetes. Um, classically, they're referred to as adult onset and juvenile 
those terms have really been kind of pushed aside because we're beginning to see um, the adult onset show up in, in kids as well. And so we go with type 1 and type 2. Okay. Type 2 diabetics are individuals who exercise actually can be a huge therapeutic benefit. Type 1, we're going to find out, not as much. Exercise is still going to be important for those individuals, but it won't have the same response or the same effects on glucose transport as we see with a type 2 diabetic. To the point where the type 2 diabetic may actually be able to come off all of the meds and almost become non-diabetic. But we'll talk about that in more detail um, the next time. Next time we'll pick up with facilitated glucose transport and talk a little bit more about the glucose transporters uh, and identify some of their differences.